It's great fun to be here. Um, I've, I've had the opportunity to be on Vashon a few times and uh, it's, it's a wonderful community. I feel so privileged to be here. My background is in nursing. Uh, I have spent most of my career at Seattle Children's Hospital in Seattle, and, but I find my way meandering around at other children's pediatric organizations. Um, my claim to fame is being the puberty lady. I created a class 28 years ago for parents and kids to sit together and talk about puberty and sex. And we have an opportunity to teach that class, well, this last year to over 14,000 people. We teach it in Seattle and Bellevue, on Bainbridge, Everett, Tacoma, Federal Way. But we also teach it down in San Francisco, Palo Alto, and throughout the Bay Area. And we have, oh, Portland, Bend, Oregon. So we have a great time. I've basically figured out how to think and talk about sex every day and get paid for it. So, <laughs> I mean, it's a good gig. Uh, but I'm here tonight to kind of remind us uh, about what it's like to be both parent, role model, teachers, grandparents to teens and preteens. And I don't think that I'm going to say anything that is going to um, be anything more than remind you of things that you already know. Um, sometimes the best parent talk is when you go, oh yeah, <laughs> that's right, uh, interesting. And then you get a chance to go home and try something on. So I am hoping that we can create opportunities for you to practice some skills, some ideas, and for us to review some of the ideas that are kind of key to think about when we think of parenting and walking alongside kids. So to start us off, let's just imagine the decisions that your preteen teen has already made today. They already have decided whether to wake up on the alarm or to push snooze or wait for you to get them out of bed. They've already decided whether to brush their teeth or take a shower or wear deodorant, whether to wear rain boots, whether to be on time, whether to bring their history project, whether they had their cleats for the soccer practice, whether they ate their vegetables, whether they practiced their piano, did their homework, all these things are decisions throughout their day. And at any point in time in that decision-making continuum, you have a part in their life and their work as they navigate through that process. About a month ago, the Journal of the American Medical Association said that when teens and preteens have conversations with the adults that they share their life with, they ha make better decisions. They said they looked at 30 years of research, and they said when kids, teens and preteens, have conversations with you, they make better decisions, and they delay risky behavior. So I know you're already flashing to the fantastic conversation you've already had today with your person. You said, hey, how was your day? And they said, fine. Or maybe they said, fine. <laughs> or maybe they said, fine. Or maybe they said, fine. Or maybe you have someone really talkative. And they said, it was OK, it was fine. <laughs> and you're kind of already wondering, so how did that conversation actually make a difference in the life of your person? And then I'm wondering if I could just picture the rest of the conversation. And I don't know if you're like me at all, but does this sound at all familiar when it comes to your part of the conversation? Hey, how was the day? How are you? How did it go? How much homework do you have? Did you get that project turned in? Did you talk to Mr. Phelps? How did the French test go? Did you get an A on that history project? Do you have your cleats? Did you remember your gym clothes? Did you eat your vegetables? Are you going to practice the piano? Are you going to get a job? Are you sure you really want to wear that? Can, can anybody identify with just this sort of litany of familiar sounding words on your part? Well, I'm just going to offer up the idea that that is not a conversation. That's just you making sure that they will do the right thing and the decisions that you're hoping for them to do. And that is, I know you're thinking to yourself, yes, but if I didn't ask those things, it would all go sideways. 
it's up to me to hold it together and make sure that momentum is being created so it all goes well for tomorrow. And although there is some element of truth to that, I'm just going to invite us to explore some different possibilities. So I'm gonna start off right away with you practicing something. I want you to turn to the people at your table, whoever many people you wanna take on at once. I want you to imagine the first time you see your kid or kids, whichever person you wanna picture, you see them after school, after practice, after whatever it is, the first moment that you catch eyes with each other. And I want you to imagine that conversation starting without a question. On your mark, get set, go. All right, how did it go? Did it feel awkward? Did it feel awkward? Did it feel unsatisfying? Did it feel like you weren't gonna get anywhere? Or did it feel relaxing? But what happened? Who felt like they just didn't even know where to start? Yeah. Yeah, so what did you say? And then quiet. Yeah, an observation. Yeah, you look like you're having fun, an observation of some sort. Hi, great to see you. You look like you're having fun. Whatever, an observation. You look angry, that looks interesting. You look like you have a lot of books. Uh, versus, do you have homework? How much da da da, da da da, and now all the, in, 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 yeah. So anybody else notice, what, it, what did it feel like? What did it feel like to receive it when somebody offered up space to not be on deck to ask questions? Because I'm telling you, I'm wondering what this would feel like. Do you know what it feels like for these kids? They show up here at 8 o'clock, it's going well. At 8.05, it's going sideways. At 8.10, someone's ignoring them. At 8.15, somebody's being called on, right? At 8.20, so when you say at three o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock, hey, how was the day? You're like, and then when you get more questions, kind of how to engage with the afternoon or evening or whatever's left of the day, I'm just imagining how that is a destroyer of conversations. Now, I'm all about questions. Questions are interesting. And you sound so nice asking them. You sound interested, and that, that, that heart of asking is authentic. And I think that the heart at asking is, I'm interested in being supportive and that you do what I need you to do. Um, but I think as kids get older, it's interesting to explore the idea all along as to what creates interesting conversations and how it may open up the opportunity to actually speak about more interesting things when there is more silence. We would never interrogate our friends of our age. We would never do that. I would never walk up and go, hey, how, I might start off, hey, how's it going? How's your marriage? Are you going to get your work done? Did you clean the kitchen like you told me you would, right? It's not a litany of performance-oriented questions on how your life is going and what I expect of you. So I'm just imagining that if we could offer up an opportunity to create space, and that we could even say, as simple as, I'll be in the kitchen when you're ready to talk about your day, I would love to hear, right? That you offer up an invitation to join you in conversation when they're ready. Now, three days may go by, okay, so I, I just want to set your expectations there, but I, I asked kids, middle school kids, what they wish their parents understood about them. And I just thought it might be helpful to you, especially those of you who have middle school kids, to hear what kids are hoping in conversations with you. They would like you to know that life is hard in middle school. Things actually are different from when you were kids. Try to understand that. 
Just because we're grumpy doesn't mean we did not get enough sleep. <laughs> you do not have to repeat instructions more than twice. We don't want you asking us every day who sat with us at lunch. <laughs> we don't like it when you ask us how our day was, but sometimes we do. You really need to ask kids first if, you, if they want advice and then just let them talk if the answer is no. I wish parents knew we do not like cleaning. <laughs> we don't need you to be worrying or asking about our lives all the time. We know what we are doing, I think, and you do not have to vacuum the entire house after I already did. Don't make the same lunch every day. And the final words of wisdom from this particular group of middle school students was, I need a cell phone. I want one because the crime rate is up and I get lost a lot too. <laughs> now, when we think about our conversations, let's put it in the developmental space and take a second to kind of imagine what life is like as a preteen teen and what's going on. I'm a developmentalist. I like to think about where kids are developmentally and where they're ready for decisions. And there's some really wonderful work done and I'd like to explore some of that research and some of that work on, on when our kids are ready to make interesting decisions on their own. But let me start by saying, um, let me start by saying that in every family, decisions are made, and in every healthy family, some of the decisions are made by the grown-ups. In every healthy family, some of the decisions are made by the kids. And in every healthy family, some of the decisions are shared. And when our kids are little, I mean, again, just remembering what that was like, all the decisions were made by you. And, and I'm kind of picturing that as they get older, you're you're more and more allowing to be shared and then for them to be on their own, right? That's the ideal thing. When our kids were little, they went to a school with a uniform. My husband would wake up, say to the kids, guys, do you want to wear the white shirt or the white shirt, right? That was the decision to be made that day. And I, I, that's kind of what life is like when your kids are little. And then as they get older, more and more are shared. But how do you know? when they're ready. And there's so much about kids that we know and don't know in terms of their brain development and, and their readiness. But let's explore a little bit about the truth about where kids are that we do know and kind of help us understand some of the stresses and strains of, of where they're at. I know this is hard to see, but I'll just point out and tell you that I'm going to talk about four aspects of kids' developmental self in adolescence. Their physical, emotional, cognitive, and social parts of who they are. And I believe strongly that there are four primary tasks of adolescence, meaning that there are four ideas that each adolescent needs to achieve to kind of become a fully adult person. And that part of the work of childhood and adolescence in each of these spaces is that developmental task. And th these are based on my ideas and my work, but I, I'm going to throw them out for you to consider. Because sometimes I think we spend our conversations on different things than the work our kids really need to do. So let's just explore that for a bit. I have to start with physical. My primary task here is confidence. And about a week ago, I decided to change this slide to courage instead of confidence because I've decided nobody is perfectly confident of, them, of their physical self. You know, even, even, even the top, even, even Russell Wilson has an off day where he does not feel confident about his physical self. I think courage is maybe perhaps the dynamic task here where in spite of our lack of confidence, we still go forward physically. And that may be actually a developmental task of adolescence there. But, but let's just cruise through because I don't think you can separate out the challenge of puberty and in adolescence for a couple of reasons. First, we see ourselves on how others see, see us. And the transformation project of puberty, let me make a couple of points. First is most of girls will finish puberty by the time they're entering into this building, early high school. 
and boys will just be getting started. They're running about two years behind. Girls' puberty is super distinct. It has very big markers, and it is a five to six year journey. It starts somewhere in elementary school, it's at its height in middle school and finishing off by high school. Girls will have, within a short amount of time, grown two to 10 inches, gained 15 to 55 pounds, have breasts, have body odor, have pimples, have new hair in interesting places. The average age to begin menarche for girls in the United States is 12-ish, with a wide range of normal. Compare that to boys. They will have started somewhere in middle school, and to be totally and completely honest, for puberty for boys kind of seriously goes on for forever. Uh, <clears throat> it would be completely typical for boys to be growing in college. It would be so, you know, not abnormal to be growing in college. And some secondary sex characteristics for boys that show up in puberty don't even show up until your 30s. Some people don't get chest hair or even facial hair until their late 20s. So part of the work of puberty for boys gets extended out across time. The reason why I bring that up is picture yourself in the land of puberty in this interesting space of time. The two most stressful times we know for kids in puberty are the earliest developing girl and the latest developing boy. First of all, the earliest developing girl is, under, uh, is the very first person to go through puberty in her space because the boys haven't started and she's first. And because we sexualize so much of girls' puberty, the earliest developing girl is right away under a spotlight that is uniquely sexual. If you doubt me on that, just go home and Google the word girl, because you're going to spend some pages. I have sometimes gone through six pages before I got to the Wikipedia definition of the word girl, because there's so many hot girls before that, which is different than when you Google the word boys. You get a lot of adorable boys, for sure, for pages, until you get your first hot boy. It's disappointing if you're looking for the hot boy, because you have to page through. <laughs> the reason why that is interesting is that our understanding of ourselves, how we see ourselves, puts us at risk for different decisions. We know that earliest developing girls, early sexualized girls, are more at risk for sexual behavior than a later developing girl. It's just the way it works. The expectation of who she is within our community and, and her behavior and then what we say and talk to her about is different. A very, very stressful idea for a boy is to be the latest developing boy because not only are you last of all people in your crowd to be going through puberty, uh, you'll be there kind of for forever. Because until you take off, right, you will be the smallest person, and there's no lower common denominator in social sphere than a freshman boy here who is tiny. See, girls' puberty takes you away from American idealized understanding of beauty because you're bigger. Girl, boys' puberty takes you toward what we consider a man. You're bigger. Your voice is deepened. You have muscles. You have facial hair. So I just want you to picture the land of puberty and its importance to how that makes us feel about ourselves. Then put yourself outside a traditional gender. <laughs> then you're in a whole nother land of puberty that is confusing and interesting and defined by others. There is a study at the University of London where they took middle school girls and they put them through an MRI and they measured their brain activity and they tried to see what would make it light up. They said, the room is large, the chairs are black, and your friends have just seen you picking your nose. When they watched the brain activity of those girls, the room is large, flat line, chairs are black, flat line, your friends have just seen you picking your nose, and every other self-conscious statement, and their brains lit up like fireworks. Probably no surprise. But then they wanted to see how that translated to older women. So they took the mothers of the middle school girls and they put them through the MRI and they said, the room is large, flat line, chairs are black, flat line, your friends have just seen you picking your nose. They couldn't even light a dull light bulb <laughs> with the brain activity of those mothers. The mothers were like, 
I have no, this doesn't even register for me, that self-consciousness that was so powerful at a time of most difference. If you think of how you see yourself and then putting into a place of making a decision, the vulnerability, of course, is when you are different. And the place of most difference physically in the world of adolescence is in the land of puberty, right? Everybody here knows that there's a 100-pound weight difference between two freshmen on the freshman football team at this school. That there's a, uh, my best friend weighed 65 pounds when I weighed 130. That's, that's half of me, right? So this place of difference is a important idea. When you think of your own team, you think of your own preteen, picture where they are in that land. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna cruise through uh, the land of puberty here because I want it, I want, here's boys' puberty between the ages of 10 and 18. Four inches, 15 to 75 pounds. The first indication of boys' puberty, by the way, is testicular growth, so you can be sure they're announcing that to all of you, right? Most boys are able to, are sexually reproductive, 14-ish, 14-ish. Um, so let's just cruise through. Let me, let me make a hopeful an interesting thing about the land of puberty that, that I think is important and that is this. Because there's very, first of all, most puberty experience is genetic, right? The timing of puberty, the size and shape you become is, is almost entirely determined by genetics. Um, and yet when we think of kind of the health risks that our kids are in, there are three ideas that I think we can do to help our kids take care of their bodies during a an, an enormous transformation project and growth. This is the second biggest growth section of time for a child's body, second only from birth to one, right? This, this, is, that, this is extraordinary. And there are three things you can offer up your kids. The fuel of great food, the fuel of great food, the fuel of great sleep, and to vaccinate your kids. And, and those three I think, things you have control over uh, meaning that, that those health ideas can be taught within your family, and so those can be interesting ones to explore for you. Uh, but some of the rest of the puberty experience is kind of outside your control. How we see ourselves, though, and, and learning how to be conf kind of uh, courageous, um, even in the, la in the face of lack of confidence, is kind of the task to take on. Let's just move on to some other interesting ideas, which is the part of our brains responsible for emotions. I'm imagining that everybody here knows what it's like when somebody comes home and says to you, what? That is so unfair, I'm sure. Anybody ever experience anything like that? Or when somebody comes into your house and then all of a sudden just goes, I hate it. Any, you know, any remote emotional space. We're wired from the beginning to be emotional people. In fact, at the center of our brain is about a almond-shaped size of our brain, the amygdala, the limbic system, where fear and anger, sadness are expressed. Right next to it, right next to that emotional center, is a tiny little part called the hippocampus that is the memory center. From the very first minutes we're born, we're emotional people. If we feel frightened, we'll express that through crying. Then someone will hold us, and then we'll build a little memory about that. And so that the next time we feel frightened, our brain goes, you know, let's see, what worked last time? Oh yeah, crying. And then someone holds you, and then you build a memory about that. So that throughout your life, you create an emotional response to respond to your environment and you build a memory about that. And that wiring up of your emotional center is a lifetime process. What is unique about the human brain is that, uh, or uniquely wonderful about the human brain, is that it prioritizes its important parts of growth by by not being completely wired up from the very beginning so that it builds upon itself 
from the very beginning, the part of our brain that is the most intact is your brain stem right here, where your heart is beating and your lungs are working without any thinking on your part. We couldn't be here without our brain stem, first part of our brain, most important part. Then, from the back, being built towards the front, motor and language, right, certain cognitive things, the very last part of our brain that gets wired up is the computer right here, the prefrontal cortex. The computer in the front of our brain is the great computer manager of our emotions. And it's the very last thing that gets wired up. So essentially, your kids are running on gut instinct and pure emotion as they build those branches and those experiences that allow those emotions to get wired up to that prefrontal cortex. The way I can best describe that is this. If, I to if your kids were here, whether they're four years old or 19, if I told a super sad story, I could get most of them to cry like that. I'm, first of all, I'm a great storyteller, and second, I love making kids cry, so it's easy. <laughs> you, sitting right next to that person crying, would say to yourself, I feel sad. That was a sad story. But I'm not going to cry right here because I have cried before in front of some of these people and that did not go well for me. So I'm going to pause on my feeling of sadness and wait and cry out in the parking lot later. Do you see the difference? Kids, teens, preteens and teens will act on more feelings than you, the petrified adult brain that you are, completely wired up and finished and very practiced at calling upon this vast storage of memories that have told you and taught you how to manage your feelings. Self-control may be the most important primary task of adolescence, the idea that you could pause before you act on every feeling, yet somewhat we just imagine that that sort of comes with human beings. It doesn't. And it's very influenced by temperament. Some of you and some of your kids are very impulsive people. They were born impulsive. They are impulsive. They will forever be impulsive. They could be 85 and still impulsive. And their self-control or their quick to action on things is very augmented by their temperament on top of their brain growth. So some of us come well equipped to show and share our emotions in an interesting way. However, this idea of our brain needing to actually learn the task of self-control is a very important idea when it comes to decision making. If you think of self-control as that if I were standing here feeling very self-conscious that I did not I'm covered in pimples, I've gained 75 pounds, I'm the quirkiest, oddest, most interesting person on the planet, and somebody said to me, you are ridiculous, here you go, here's what we're going to offer you, and it's tempting and interesting for me to be able to say yes to you, to relieve my self-consciousness, and I'd have very low self-control, I'm quick to say yes. You see the vulnerability in that? So we have an opportunity to help our kids grow in their self-control of emotional selves. I picture your brain very much like a tree. The roots of your brain are the way we're wired up from the beginning. The trunk is how the things that we've learned. And then between birth and sixth grade, our brain puts on a bazillion branches. And you've helped develop the branches of your kids. You've taught them how to camp and tie their shoes and learn French and build a fire. And they have play the piano, write all those branches. The branches of a sixth grader to 23-year-old girl and a 25-year-old boy, that brain is being pruned away, all the branches that they're no longer using or using well, to help the branches of the things that they are doing all the time get bigger. For instance, if you haven't spoken French since you were in kindergarten, <laughs> there goes that branch. But the branch for you for Latin has gotten enormous because you've just taken it on. You've been looking at Latin words and phrases and you're intrigued by it and you've been taking it on ever since middle school. 
You haven't tied your sh I've made you. Uh, you haven't tied your shoe since kindergarten. <laughs> there goes your tying shoe branch, but your Velcro branch is giant. <laughs> you know this to be true because you don't, there are very few professional athletes or musicians that have not been doing their skill, their asset, their gift since they've been in middle school. In fact, most of our adult brain has been built since middle school. Most of the biggest branches in your brain have been there since middle school. That doesn't mean you can't learn new things. I learned how to row at the age of 50. I'm really good. I go, I'll be going to San Diego. We're going to win gold. Are we going to go to Boston? We're going to win gold. We love racing against these Vashon people. I'd love to take them down. <laughs> I'm good, but I'm not. I am not the rower my daughter is who's been rowing since middle school, and I never will be. I, I will tell you, I could, I could be on that water 10,000 hours. I'm never going to row like her. The brains of middle school and high school kids are the brains of the adult brains. Let me tell you something incredibly powerful. Almost 100% of problem adult drinkers drank in middle school. Almost all chain smoking, cigarette smoking adults smoked in middle school. In fact, if you don't drink on any sort of regular basis until your early 20s, the chances of you becoming an adult drinker are statistically zero. If you want to build a big branch, do the work in middle school and high school. I say to kids all the time, if you want to be good at math, you actually have to do math problems now. <laughs> uh, if you want to be an interesting, giving, contributing person in the world, do it now. Just remind your kids how teenagers change the world. The civil rights movement in the United States was built on the backs of adolescents. Who else would be brave enough to sit at a lunch counter and have people stuff a cigarette onto your head and throw an ice cream cone in your face? Nobody, except a teenager, who would say, I'm here, I'm doing it, no one can take me off this, I'm there, you know, right? An adult would go, wait a sec, I've done that before, and that did not go well for me. I'm going to pause before I do anything courageous like that. You have to be a change agent with courage and there is no greater resource on the planet than a teenager and some of it has to come from both this asset and their liability. So we get the work of helping them build this brain, helping them build the branches that are going to be strong and interesting and resilient, right? And part of the work is helping create an opportunity for self-control. And I'm going to teach you how to do that task in just a minute, but I want to talk a little bit, oh, I want to talk a little bit about emotions and gender for a second. We love working with middle school kids, and we love to hand them a card, an anonymous card, and have them finish the sentence. We hand the girls a card, and the sentence says, the thing I wish all middle school boys understood about middle school girls is, and then they finish, fix that card, and then we ask the boys to do the same, reverse. Now, holding gender loosely, right, I just think we look at it as a cultural perspective. The girls will write, and we've maybe done this, I don't know, 800 times, 1,000 times, 1,200 times, lots of times. The girls write a lot of things. They write lists of things that they would like the boys to understand about them. Um, but the boys uh, write one single solitary idea. The boys write, um, we, the middle school boys, wish that you, the middle school girls, understood that we, the middle school boys, have feelings. My business partner, uh, Dr. Rob Lehman, is a physician, and every time when we do this, and he reads the boys' cards, and I read the girls' cards, we can barely speak by the end, and he turns to me and he says, it just happened again. I cannot believe if I wasn't reading these cards myself, I would never believe you. 
we do not allow our boys, except on a soccer field, to actually cry. We, we, we don't imagine that they have the full range of emotions. If I ask girls in the sixth grade, fifth grade, fourth grade, second grade, what about boys? Don't they have feelings? <laughs> no. No. Think about how we communicate who we are emotionally and what we wish people understood about us. Because how we are most fully known is through our emotional selves, right? So what would that feel like if you were never allowed to express that? How should I deal with my feelings if I feel a zillion things at once? Puberty, the hormones of puberty are like a volume dial to emotions. I actually am always bummed, to be totally honest, when parents say, um, the thing I am least looking forward to is the moodiness of my team. Especially people say, I'll be honest, the moodiness of my girl. And I find myself sad by that. First of all, I feel like we never really understand how important moods are. That they reflect the world and our response to it. Second, that we don't really appreciate the fact that our kids have seriously been moody the entire lifetime. I like to remind people, like when they said to their two-year-old daughter, no, to the cookie, what did they do? They threw themselves down on the ground and were moody, right? Change of mood, strong mood. Mood is a part of being a human being. Mood is how we express ourselves. Self-control, we expect from someone who's older, who has language and the ability to self-control, but self-control is a learned idea. Moods and changeable moods, strong moods, are an important part of our growing up, and hormones of puberty are like a volume dial. Sadness could feel more sad mad could feel more mad, I'd like to maybe encourage you to consider the idea that maybe you're just, while you're having your period, learning what you're actually mad at. Because it's the same mood. Why do you always insist on talking to me about feelings and try to make me do the things that you would do when I'm not you? I have different feelings about growing older. I feel nervous. It's a big responsibility. I like to think that we have room for the emotions of our kids. In fact, the most famous helpers of all that we're going to learn a skill from, the Gottmans, they talk about how emotions are casting out to you. Even anger is a casting out to you. Laura Kastner, she's spoken here on Vashon several times. She likes to do this. Picture your kids like that, right? Sometimes anger is a big smoke screen for saying, don't go too far, don't believe this too much. I just need to renegotiate the relationship, right? I just need to renegotiate this relationship and I'm gonna show you my anger. Sometimes it's helpful when your kids are mad, really mad, to also picture that most of the time, anger is a smokescreen for fear. So if you see someone really angry, is it that, what are they worried about? And sometimes for teens, it's worried that you're actually gonna walk away. And then they get more mad, which makes you want to, of course, walk away. So it's just an interesting thing to think about your emotional self. But let's, let's swing through, through cognitive and competence. I want to make sure that you know that if I ever work with a group of juniors in high school, I like to say to them, if your family says to you, are you losing your mind, it is totally legitimately true to say, yes, I am. Because that pruning away process is really middle school, high school work of pruning away branches. Your junior in high school is actually operating with less than a sixth grader. So you can just imagine that some of the things that they're taking on and learning um, are being pruned away while they're renegotiating those branches. Our brains from the very beginning are wired up in these ways. One, 
is our brains are wired up from the beginning to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Our brain will light up with the release of dopamine that says, good work, good work, this is good, when we have achieved a pleasure experience. For you, it's chocolate. For you, it's an A+. Plus. For you, it's a beer. I don't know. All sorts of things will release dopamine, things that are good for us and things that can be harmful. Picture again if your brain is wired up for pleasure and will actually resist pain. If you're someone who has gained 75 pounds, is covered in pimples, has greasy hair, forgot to wear deodorant, feels a little out of sorts, their emotions feel high, they've been put into a situation and someone says, hey, have a beer. And you knew that having a beer created pleasure, what would you do? People in this room have a drink to create that same feeling. So recognizing its power in terms of creating pleasure, and especially when you learn to repeat it. Because let's say you felt awkward, irritated, angry, and having a beer soothed and created a pleasurable experience, and then you built a memory about it. Then the next time you got into that same situation with that same group of people, it's very challenging not to want to continue the cycle again. Build a branch. Right? So we have to recognize the vulnerability and the opportunity here that our brains are wired up to seek pleasure. And there's lots of good things out there. And there are lots of things that make it challenging to create a healthy, interesting decision for kids. Our brains from the beginning are wired up to seek approval and avoid disapproval. Your brain will do anything to stand in alignment with other people. There are all sorts of studies. There's a ton of really fun studies of boys playing a video race car driving game. They say to the boys, in a, they put the single boy with the single game in a single room all by themselves, and they say, play this game, pay attention to all the driving rules, and get the highest score you can. The boys achieve a certain score, they bring them into a room like this. They put them in a chair up to a game right here with all of their friends sitting out here. And they say, now drive that car, paying attention to the rules, and see if you can match or exceed that score. And there isn't a single boy that goes through that thing and doesn't break every single rule to get a higher score to impress his friends. Again, no surprise yet, imagine again if my brain seeks the approval of others and avoids disapproval, how challenging it is to stand and choose something different. Because being aligned with all of you is part of the work I'm seeking. And seek connection, avoid disconnection. My brain is flooded with oxytocin when I have an opportunity to connect. Oxytocin is especially powerful in the girl world. If, we have, if you're at a high school dance, if we could all just remember what it's like to be at a high school dance. And ladies in the room, if one of us were to say to somebody else, a bunch of us, and we said, hey, I'm going to run to the bathroom, how many people would you imagine might go with us? <laughs> Plus or minus? Four? Eight? <laughs> I asked a group. <laughs> I asked a group of freshmen in high school on Sunday when I did a really fun thing with freshmen and high school girls, and I said, how many? And they said six. So that's, you're a little overkill. <laughs> if, if you're picturing us in the bathroom, would we be talking to each other? Of course. Yes, of course. And if one of us has been able to bring a phone in under under some sort of secret rule breaking, would we, ladies, would we take photos of each other all dressed up at the dance? Yes, of course. Gentlemen, if in your lifetime, 
I don't even care if you're at the high school dance, just lifetime of going to the bathroom. You say to people, I am now going to the bathroom. I don't, I'm not even going to limit you to the high school dance. How many people do you expect to go with you? Zero. And if you happened to run into one of these people in the bathroom, would you speak? Not a lot. And if, if by any chance you had a phone and had the capability of taking some photos in the men's bathroom, would you? I rest my case here. What is that, nature or nurture on gender? I, I think the answer is yes on that. What do we expect? What do we imagine? What is a part of our lives? And then bring in sex, drugs, rock and roll, and anything that goes bump in the night. And we will find ourselves and our brains saying, yes, I'm a part of that. I, it is very hard to turn off. Last idea, from the very beginning, our brains are wired up under stress to fight or flee. There was an earthquake right here on Vashon. We would immediately go into a stress mode. Our, our bodies would bring most of our circulation to our core, making our hands all clammy, right? Making it even sometimes hard to move our feet, but our heart would be beating. We well, you know that feeling that we've all had. And fight or flee is a very strong response. We've been wired up from the beginning. Testosterone, testosterone is a wonderful accelerant to, to fight or flee. And, and oxytocin is a wonderful disconnector to tend and befriend. So when you think of the world of gender and how we express the social lives and social stresses of our lives, again, imagining how we communicate, either nature or nurture, the answer is yes. Here's the way it plays itself out. My friend John Medina describes it this way. If you have two boys and a rock, the first boy says, I'm going to throw a rock and hit that pole. And the second boy says, I'm going to throw a rock and hit that back wall. And the first boy says, I'm going to throw a rock and hit the moon. When we think of the cognitive development of our boys' brains matched with the social hierarchy of what we expect from boys, it is a one up. It is a one up. And testosterone is a fuel to that one up idea. And when people say, oh, you're so lucky you have boys, I think people forget, A, they can't show any emotions, and B, as long, it's great as long as you're not the one down. I don't care if it's in math class or on the football field. It's not a great place. And then you add to it that puberty experience of boys if you're the latest developing boy. Can you see the picture being developed there? We will always reward the biggest boy. It's, it's true. I love to say that it's different, but when I ask kids all the time, gosh, I have so many stereotypes about high school, middle school kids, about popular, but I keep seeing in every movie and television show that the popular guys are good at sports. And they go, well, not here at this school. We do it different here. And I go, oh, OK. So I'm just going to walk across. I'll be at 1. It never shows up at this school. And 10, it always shows up at this school. I walk one, two, three, four, five, six, nobody has their hand up. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the hands are up. It's mostly true. We reward that. We reward pretty girls. Popular girls are pretty. There's an amazing Google search where they looked at all the Google searches on the planet. Gr Parents were asking, and you know as a parent because you say, is my daughter, right? Three times more likely to say, is my daughter pretty than a boy? And they're three times more likely, three to five times more likely to say, is my son brilliant? Distressing, isn't it? Oh my goodness. All right.
Goodness. All right. This slide I will read to you. There is a wonderful study done at Stanford University. It's been repeated multiple times, Vanderbilt, et cetera. And the question was done by a group of researchers that looked at what, what, how old is a person who can make an adult decision? So they first had to decide what are the characteristics of a mature decision maker? And they have three characteristics of a mature decision maker. First characteristic, you can be autonomous in a group. You could stand alone in a group and go, although you are all gossiping, I'm going to choose not to gossip. Okay? Second characteristic of a great decision maker is that you have perspective of time beyond this moment and others beyond myself that an adult in a certain situation under the pressure of conformity would actually choose to evaluate the perspective of the effect of time beyond this moment and others beyond myself. You can imagine that being a helpful characteristic. And the third idea of a great decision maker is that you have impulse control. Now, let's put those two slides together in our minds, what we're wired up from the beginning to do and what a great decision maker is, because there is a giant collision of ideas here. First, our brain is seeking conformity and seeking approval. It is very hard to be autonomous in a group. Our brain seeks pleasure, is learning self-control. It is very hard to show impulse control. And because we have no impulse control and because our brain is under construction, it is really hard to have perspective of time beyond this moment, impulse control, and others beyond myself. So given that those are the characteristics of being a great decision maker, they went out and studied kids. They looked at elementary school kids, middle school kids, high school kids, college kids, young adults. Because we have learned that a brain for a girl is pretty much wired up by the time she's 23 and a boy at 25. So they went through that age group. They put kids in simulators. They gave them written tests. They put them in focus groups. They wired them up to stress monitors. They did all sorts of crazy stuff. And they had a single group of people that rose straight to the top as the most fabulous decision makers on the planet, the sixth graders. <laughs> then it took a serious deep dark dive down to the worst decision makers on the planet on those three characteristics, juniors in high school, then it crawled its way back up to surpassing sixth grade by a 23-year-old girl and a 25-year-old boy. Now, I love that study because it pretty much summarizes everything we've been talking about. Sixth graders, the time with the most branches, and the last bastion of concrete thought. If, if you've ever had a sixth grader in your life, and some of you, most of you may have, you know their favorite line is this. It's not fair. They're the great judges. They see the world in black and white. They are very assured of their decision-making prowess. If I put a sixth grader in an incredibly stressful social situation, this is what they will say, hands down, I would never be there. My dad would get mad, would never do that, would never say yes. I would never go there. I would never have said yes in the first place. I would never even have found myself there. It's never going to happen. I take the same exact scenario two years later to the same group of kids, and I can make them cry. They'll go like this, oh, oh, God, would my dad find out about that? <laughs> because first and foremost, an eighth grader is far more abstract thinker than a sixth grader. An eighth grader could imagine 
that whether I say yes or no here, something wins and something loses, right? I could lose a friend or the respect of my dad. I have to have perspective of time beyond this moment, others beyond myself. And all of a sudden I realize if I said yes immediately, I get reward. But over time, that might be painful. The difference between sixth and eighth grade is enormous on the idea of concrete to abstract. But here's another thing. The difference between a sixth grader and an eight, nine, 10, 11, 12th grader is this. A sixth grader would say, my parents are this big. And my friends, yeah, they're this big. An eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year old would say, 12th grader would say, my friends are this big. How big do they say you are? Seems like it's possible that the world will tell us that they say that we're this big. And they'll even tell us that sometimes. But in fact, what makes it a torture test for any eighth grader is when you stay big. See, when we stay big, an eighth grader has a harder time saying yes. And I mean big in a connected way, not big in an authoritarian way, but big in a way that says, I know you, I care about you, I'm invested in you, I'm talking to you, I hear you, that we feel we know and understand each other. If you think of the most dysfunctional teenager sitting in Seattle right now tonight, they're sitting over in juvie. First, they have an emotional toolkit that has a single word in it that says mad. It's not very interesting. Second thing is, they don't have you. So when someone came along and said, hey, do you want to they had nothing but the approval of the moment and the people in front of them because they don't have you. Once I have to add you into my thinking, it creates a torture test. And there's nothing better than to create a torture test for a teenager. I highly recommend it. I want to share with you a new thing for you to practice. I want to talk about a little bit about John and Julie Gottman. John and Julie Gottman have been the most valuable researchers of human relationships and development ever on the planet, certainly today, that exists today. They are in Seattle. They've been at the University of Washington. They now run the Gottman Institute. They're extraordinary. Their books are amazing. And they themselves are fabulous people. They started off 30, 40 years ago by building a love lab, an apartment on Portage Bay where they invited married couples to come in and hang out for 48 hours in this apartment and live, where they wired up with video cameras the community space and told them, hey, just live for 48 hours and argue, carry on, and talk, and we're just going to record you. So right away, they're famous for having the largest library of recorded people arguing and talking in the history of the world. And second, they mathematically looked at those conversations and tried to answer this interesting question, which is, what makes a great marriage? And after studying that for 30 years, they were pretty much able to answer it in a single sentence, which said, a great marriage is when people know and understand themselves to be known and understood. And then they've spent the rest of their career teaching people how to communicate knowing, connecting, and being understood. Somewhere along in that first 30 years, they started to look at kids and parents. And they said, you know, let's ask the same question, except let's put it in the parenting world. And let's ask the question about these amazing kids that make great decisions. Who are those kids? Why are they that way? 
And we're going to define great decision-making kids by their ability over time to, to um, perform at their capacity in the classroom and perform on the playground to navigate through challenging situations and successful situations. Whatever we throw out them, they're able to manage it. And playground meaning whatever that looks like for high school, because they followed families for 20 years. They followed the same group of families for 20 years. They wired people up to heart monitors. They took urine, uh, stressed their urine for stress. They tested their urine for stress. They had them teach each other things, argue with each other, recorded it, listened to their conversations. They studied these families for 20 years. And they asked, who are the kids that are great decision makers and how did they get that way? And they were able to answer it in a single sentence. They said, hey, those interesting, resilient kids, they feel known. They know themselves to be known and understood and heard. Same answer. So then they have been teaching people how to communicate being known and understood and heard. So we're going to learn it now. I'm going to teach you the Gottman way to know and understood in a simple conversation, and then we're going to practice it. So here are the biggest ten tenets to it. First, it starts off with some sort of response to an emotion. Because our kids, whether they're 12th grade or four years old, are emotional people, we're going to work with whatever emotion gets handed to us in that moment. If it's a sad thing, if it's an angry thing, if it's an interesting, confused thing, we're going to work with that thing. And our response to it is some sort of empathetic response, like, wow, that is rough. that without an empathetic response, it is actually really hard for anybody to move on to making an action plan to making a decision. That empathy and an empathetic response is so key to that, we often get stuck in sh continuing to throw a fit about something or to shut down because no one has heard or understood us. I'll prove it to you right now. If you came home tonight and said to an adult you share your life with, I did it the worst friggin' day in the history of the planet, and your adult said to you, your adult partner in crime said to you, put on a smiling face, my mother's coming over in a minute, I don't want to be arguing, we're going to that thing at school tonight to hear the speaker, here's a cookie, be good. Do you feel heard and understood? No, you do not feel dismissed. It feels friendly. They offered you a cookie. <laughs> but it's not really being heard and understood. If you came home tonight, said the adult you share your life with, I just had the worst friggin' day in the history of the planet, and someone said, I told you you would. If you had done what I had said, it would have gone different. Here are six ideas on how I would take care of that tomorrow. Do you feel heard and understood? No, you do not. And yet those two approaches are the most common parenting approaches to an emotional engagement with our kids. Just how we're wired. We dismiss like, hey, you're not starving. Your life is good. Here's a cookie. And I could tell you all the fantastic ways that I could solve that problem in a second. So, toolkit part, no, there's three parts to the toolkit. Toolkit part number one, an empathetic response. Sometimes, for some adolescents, that is all you need to do. You could stop right there. Because having the opportunity for someone to sit and go, God, is sometimes all the fuel you need to be able to go, yeah. Gosh, that just, I'm so glad, you, yeah, you get that. I mean, like, I, what I want you and you're already, if you have an adolescent in your life that continues to repeat, 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 anger response, whine response, something that is so irritating, think about how they somehow have not felt 
some sort of acknowledgement on this part, and is there a way that you could rearrange your response? Because they're trying to tell you something. All right, empathy response does toolkit part number one. Toolkit part number two. Kids who are excellent decision makers, according to the Gottmans, can come up with their own idea to solve a problem. Now, you can be the coach. You could say, if somebody said, I don't even know what to do, you could say, well, hmm, have you ever felt that way before? Stop talking. See how much silence there is when you get into a great Gottman thing? There's silence. You could even say, hey, if you're, when you're ready, I've got some ideas, but you know. Right? I know you're, I think the communicating thing here is, you're an amazing, capable person. I know you're going to come up with something great. Whether you actually say those words or not, that's, that's the way that you're, what you're communicating. You're an interesting, capable, amazing person. I can't wait to see what you come up with. See, the second we start solving things, here's what you're communicating. I'm not sure you would ever come up with this on your own, so I will fill it in for you. It's quicker, easier, and I've been down this road before. Hear the difference in those two kind of affects? So empathetic response. See if they can come up with some of their own ideas. Might be a question response. So, wow, what do you, I wonder what you're going to do. That'd be tough, right? And then the third idea with the Gottmans is kids who are great decision makers get really good at predicting the consequence of the action that they're going to choose. They get really good at it. And the only way you can get good at predicting a consequence is A, if you experience a consequence, and B, if you get an opportunity to go out there and fail. So some of the best decision-making branches that we could ever build is when it doesn't go well. So one of the craziest, wildest ideas of this whole Gottman thing is that you're going to create a conversation right now, and you have no guarantee that it's going to go well. And what you're going to hang out there is the possibility that it actually goes sideways, and that your preteen teen is going to make a ridiculous choice. And then you're just going to have to think about what that feels and looks like from your standpoint and how much you're putting at risk and what you're willing to do, right? So I'm going to give you guys a chance to practice. You've got three ideas, an empathetic response, having them come up with a solution, and trying to think through a consequence. You don't always have to do all three, but we're going to practice all three, and I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a scenario, the simplest scenario I can come up with. You've gone to the soccer game. You've watched the end of the game. Your preteen teen, however they are, jumps into the car and goes, I hate this team. I'm out of here. I'm quitting tomorrow. Go. All right. I want to give you guys a couple more to practice on. How did that go? Did it feel awkward? Was there a special thing that was worked well for you? Tell me, tell me a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So she said it feels awkward, hard, if the youth is still really upset to come up with solutions. And I think what I love about that is it how quickly, right, all of a sudden we need more space time? But how, if I'm talking to people about their real life, in fact, just the other night I gave a parent talk and this mom goes, I don't have time to wait for that, <laughs> right? The principal was there and he goes, I don't care what it takes, that needs more time. But isn't it funny how all of a sudden now you wanted to pause and create space? Because you're right. If, you, if you're too hot, you're not ready to engage, which is true for us as well, right? Yet, in a time where we're like, 
how we need to create space. And even just allowing the space before we've created a solution or handed a cookie or whatever we've done, to allow the opportunity to let this person just be mad right now. I think it could come a week later. I think the older your kids are, and what amazing self-control that shows, that we don't problem solve about it until we come back to it. So let's say it's us in a fight. First of all, the Gottmans would say, minute and a half to three minutes, if you're still arguing, no one wins. So if we're still hot, hot, right? If we're still hot, we need to be able to say, look, I, I think it's, you know, why don't you go ahead and go to soccer. I'm going to drive 10 carpools, make dinner, help your brother with his homework, walk the dog 50, 60 times around the block, and call some friends. And then, you know, let's try again after dinner. Or I am going to need some time to think that through because I just feel so hot myself. I, I need a day, right? And sometimes that leaving things hanging feels hard, especially in a family, right? It's one thing if you hate the soccer coach, but it's hard to leave things unsettled. And we do all live with that idea that we're not supposed to go to bed with, but gosh, who does that, really? It's hard to do that. And sometimes, especially if the conflict comes up at 9 o'clock at night, you know, whew, that's like my worst problem-solving time, too. Self-control says we're not going to act on it in this minute. Isn't that the definition of self-control? So isn't it also OK to go, we, let's say our feelings out loud. The Gottmans talk a lot about the power of even being able to say the feeling out loud. I am so fr friggin' frustrated right now. Remember that kid in Juvie? She couldn't say anything more than something angry. Interesting decision-making people learn how to go, I'm disappointed, I'm frightened, I'm fearful, I'm confused, I'm intrigued, I'm curious, I'm ecstatic. That that's a rich vocabulary, and sometimes rich vocabulary comes from sitting hot for a while and letting it diffuse into something more interesting than just overall anger. All right, I'm going to give you another one, but it's not going to be anger. Let's, let's do something else. No, let's go to anger at each other, because I think that's true. So now it's not someone you're angry at outside of your family. Let's go angry you, right? Let's add some disrespect, because that's always fun. <laughs> right? That's always fun to work with. Um, and you guys can change it up, right? You guys can change the words so they feel real to you. But I'll give you the kind of the scenario, some words, and then if that doesn't feel real for you, make it real for you. So someone's going to go like, what? That's all you care about. All you care about is like my grades, how I look to others. You know, I'm, I can't even tell you anything. You're just an idiot. I, I hate you. Have fun with that. <laughs> if that feels too hot, like your person wouldn't be that hot, take it down. Be more subtle and practice it more subtle. If, someone, if you can't imagine that, make it more real for you. Can I just get a read on, from people? Was it harder, more interesting? Did it feel the same when it was more anger, disrespect toward us? Can anybody feel brave enough to say something about that? Yeah. Oh, well, do you feel angry now when someone talks to you this way? Yeah, so I think that's what we're here to talk about right now. Right, so tell me more about what you felt when someone talked to you this way. Yeah. You feel dismissed and misunderstood. Yeah, so much for trying to make them feel good when you're being flattened. Yeah, good one. 
One of the first responses uh, that people sometimes feel, and I, I am going to stereotype here a little bit on this in response, but I talk to a lot of dads who right now have two responses. The fight or flee thing is super strong right now, like I'm going to keep coming at you with my anger, that's the fight, or someone who goes, well then I'm out of here. Now, that doesn't mean that has to be only a dad response, because I know that we all have that. We all have that fight or flee, but somehow that can manifest itself, I think, in our culture, where the dad might even act that out mo most. But everybody feels that. And I think that part of this idea here is to think, let me just say one thing about when disrespect enters into a conversation that one of the most important things to remember is to not let disrespect derail what is at the heart of the conflict. It is super easy to now head down the road of disrespect. And then furthermore, if you talk to me like that, then this and that, and blah, blah, blah. And then what were you originally arguing about, which was the history test or whatever, right, gets forgotten. That sometimes, if it's possible, you're gonna just look fearless in the face of disrespect, put that on hold, because no, nobody, nobody comes down off the disrespect bandwagon when you are being attacked now and being disrespectful. It just, it never goes away. And then you've derailed the conversation. So you just put that aside, you look fearless in the face of this, and you have an opportunity to respond by saying, wow, that's strong. It's also okay to say, that's tough for me to hear. The more though we can be like our own, express our emotion or even express it angrily and be honest and say, I'm gonna need to take a break and speak to your own emotional thing. But that fight or flee thing, what is hard for an adolescent there, when somebody fights or flees in a huge way right here, is that A, I can be successful at getting us off the topic super fast, and B, I also can have myself be even more frightened by thinking this is even more out of control than I thought it was. So, when I'm in a really hot situation, I'm going to give you some ideas. Uh, my slide here does not show up very well, but I'm going, to, I'm going to throw out four interesting things to consider. One is, once you're able to speak, you know, once you're not in that place of wanting to rip their head off or whatever, you af affirm the relationship or the situation, right? This is, my, this is important to me as the dad, as, and you're my son, or you, you're the most important thing to me. The key here on affirming the relationship is to not add the word, and this is key, that you're going to want to add right here, but. I really love you, but. You're just going to say, I see how important this is to you, son. Right? I mean, you're going to affirm their feeling or affirm the relationship, and you're going to try to avoid the word but. Then, it's super helpful in a moment like this if you could try out an, your I feel statement yourself. I feel angry. I feel confused. I feel strong. I feel thing. And then very specifically what it is that's not going well right here. Right? Who, what, when, where, why. I feel... Frustrated and angry when you've ignored what we agreed to when to come in late. Last night you came in at 12.30, we had agreed at 11.30, and I was anxious and on edge, and that was tough for me. Another idea to think about saying is what you contribute. I realize I totally lost my cool there. I realize I sometimes I'm on your back for that a lot. I realize I get anxious. I realize I am nervous. 
I realize I'm crazy sometimes. <laughs> what is it? And then the final sentence to consider saying is how you can work on something together. How can I, if I can do this, can you do that? Sometimes I think of that part of it, that negotiating kind of thing. Again, sometimes this is not all in this one moment, right? It, it might take several days to say these four things because <laughs> you kind of have to heal, right? But I think what the key ideas here is that I'm trying to think of ways without fighting or fleeing, repeating itself over and over and over again and derailing off of what it is that you're actually talking about and kind of allowing the disrespect to come back to it later. You could say, hey, when you call me an idiot, that's tough for me. Most kids regret saying some of these words, right? Unless they're super, super practiced at it. Um, most kids walk away going like, you know, that's was, was kind of, right? Their impulse control is, is in question here. So, and they're defending and renegotiating this relationship. So, I think that's where disrespect sometimes, we just want to, we just want to, we feel so out of sorts, we want to head down that road when we really, we just stay with the topic, come back to the disrespect, even four days later, a week later, come back to it when it surfaces again. Come, come back to it in a safer place. But paying attention to that and letting myself go sideways on that almost never works out. Um, the names get called and places, does that make sense? So when I'm thinking about certain things when people are coming at me, is there a way that I can look, be authentic in how I express myself, and yet, is there also an opportunity for me to look a little fearless here? Like, you're the grown-up. And it might not be in the first attack, but it might be, you know, when you regather yourself, can you look a little bit more fearless? And then are there ways that you can affirm the relationship or the importance of the topic? Are there ways you can do that without the word but? Are there ways that you can speak to your own feelings? Are there ways that you can, are there ways that you can be very specific about what it is that you're concerned about? Are there ways that you can acknowledge your part in this thing that you have going? Or are there ways that you can kind of navigate on how to maybe go from here? And I have to create mantras for myself here because sometimes in the heat of moments, I can't just come up with something clever right then. I have to have practiced something over and over and over again. So I'm gonna tell you a mantra of problem solving together. And it's, it's gonna sound elementary, but you, you can, Put this mantra, if you practice it enough, you can kind of practice it in all sorts of hot situations. And that is essentially this. Okay, and these aren't my exact words that I would ever say to my kids, but this is sort of the mantra that I try to get to, which is, you're all about fun, I'm all about safety. How can we work together so that you're guaranteed at least a minimum amount of fun, and I'm guaranteed at least a minimum amount of safety? Okay, now I would never use that sentence exactly, but what it's getting to is, here's what's important to me. You, the amazing high school person who's out there in the real world, I'm not in the back of the Impala with you. So help me get to a place of understanding your plan, the plan, what's happening with the plan, to at least to the point where I can be guaranteed at least, at least a minimum amount of safety, right? You're all about fun, I'm all about homework. How can we work together so that I'm guaranteed at least a minimum amount of homework and you're guaranteed a little bit amount, minimum amount of fun? I think as our kids get older, we're navigating through. It can't still be, as a junior in high school, do you want the white shirt or the white shirt? It's too narrow. Right? Can you see and feel that? So, so I, just, I just want you to consider the idea that when we're in conversations with kids about really tough things and we feel afraid, we feel nervous for their safety or we know they're headed down a path that's difficult, 
you know, what can we help them in terms of their emotional impulse control and knowing your connectedness to them? How can they assure themselves they're known and understood by you? One of my all-time favorite people, in, in addition to the Gottmans, in addition to some other great researchers, but over at the University of Washington, there's a whole other group of researchers in the Social Development Research Group, and Dr. David Hawkins is the co-founder of that. Dr. David Hawkins had two high school kids, like many of us have had, and he is an expert, internationally renowned, about why teenagers really shouldn't be drinking. And he has spent his entire life career on trying to help kids choose better choices around high-risk behavior on drinking, marijuana, whatever, whatever. And so when he had his own two high school kids, you know, don't you just kind of wonder what he did? So he talked to them about the truth of what he understood from the research about marijuana, drinking, drugs, the whole thing. Talked to them about how it impacted their brain, how it built strong branches, how it builds addictions easily. Talked about the difference between a teen brain and an adult brain. How a teen brain doesn't feel sleepy after four drinks and an, and an adult brain is like in a coma. Talked about how it's easy to binge drink as a teenager because you're drinking fast, you don't feel sleepy. Talked, talked to them about marijuana. Talked to them about how it's confusing. It's legal, it's organic, we give it to sick people but it changes up your brain chemistry, makes you think differently, makes you respond differently. Looks like it's potentially impacting on a teen brain in the ability to create long-term memory. We don't know a lot about marijuana because it's, a, it's a, been an uncontrolled substance in our world and we don't always have any labels on the packaging from its manufacturer to be able to study it with any sort of consistency. So he talks to his kids, and he said, hey, what I hope for you is that you're not going to drink and take drugs in high school. Now, right away, I already like his approach. He's talked about the facts. He's laid it out there. He's been pretty fearless. Second thing is, he didn't create a rule for his high school kids that he couldn't enforce. He didn't say, there will be no drinking. Uh, because he knew that he would not be in the back of the Impala. And he knew that their brain was wired up to say yes, and their world is inviting in. <coughs> so he said, what I hope for you is, because he wants to stay big, right? Hear all these things kind of put, coming together? So when his oldest, his son, was a junior in high school, sound familiar of a no brain person, junior in high school. They are doing dishes together. Now, I love that part of the story because when you stand side by side and work together, you have some really great conversations. I love the idea that his son is doing the dishes. I love the fact that the two of them are doing dishes together. I love the fact that when they have a conversation by standing side by side and working on this project together, their eye contact, their verbal thing is pretty magical because it's not you, me, kind of going at it, right? And his son says, uh, I, I forgot to mention that Dr. David Hawkins had said to his kids, um, the only thing I'm going to ask is if you do start drinking or taking drugs or whatever, I'm hoping you'll tell me. That's the only thing I'm going to ask. I, and I can't enforce that. I'm just going to hope that you do. So when there's, oh, is that the rain? Isn't that that sound right now that we're listening to? Wow. Um, Dr. David Hawkins is washing dishes with his son. His son turns to him as a junior in high school and says, Dad, Dad, I'm, I'm drinking. It's hard out there. Everybody's doing it. I feel like an idiot. Uh, I want to say yes. It helps me be more popular. I'm self-conscious and insecure, and I have pimples, and I grew... 35 pounds, you know, he didn't say all those things, but you know what I'm saying. He feels like he needs to say yes, and he's been saying yes. And Dr. David Hawkins said to his son, I'm really grateful that you told me. And they talked about it some more, and then he said, you know, I've been thinking 
you know, we have that agreement about the car. And our agreement about the car is that you can drive our car as long as you pay the gas and the insurance. And the son said, yeah, that's true. And Dr. David Hopkins go, I'm going to sweeten the deal. If you start saying no to drinking until you're done with high school, I'll pay the insurance. And the son goes, yes. Now here is what I love about that story. First of all, this dad had not played all his cards. He still had cards to play. There's a lot of people in this world of abundance that let their kids have all the cards. And there's still cards to play here. This son has this accountability around this car that they can still negotiate around. It's not just his car out willy-nilly. I love that. It could be anything. It doesn't, it's just that he hasn't had all the cards. And then I love that Dr. David Hawkins could have come around and said, and then furthermore, weren't you expecting me to say no car? Instead, in fact, it's more car. And in fact, if it's true what he's saying, now he's now given his son the ability to walk up to that party and say, I would, but I have this agreement about the insurance on this car. So the answer is no. See, I got this agreement with my dad. And all of a sudden, you've got this great living excuse that continues forward. Now, again, these are not it's not rocket science, it's, I'm not advocating insurance over gas, and you, don't, you know what I'm saying? It's just all the elements about that I love. And then the favorite part about that whole thing for me is that it, when his daughter was a junior in high school, she walks straight up to him face to face and goes, Dad, you know that sweet deal you gave my brother? Well, I'm not interested in ever drinking, and I'd like the same deal. And he says, you're on. Right? Now, I love that story. Everything about that story is great. Those kids felt known, understood. They had the facts of truth around those substances in their lives. They had a conversation that was side by side over washing dishes. If their dad felt like he was the expert, yet he did not stuff that expertise down their throat, and they were able to come back and engage with him, he didn't create unenforceable rules that didn't feel like a fit. Because I'll tell you, the second you create an unenforceable rule, your kids are very smart, clever, amazing people. They will so quickly uh, circumnavigate that unenforceable rule. And you lose respect on that. Because you're not going to be in the back of the Impala. But you can continue to hope for your kids. You can pray for your kids. You can, you can write to them, tell them how important they are. You can talk to them. But what you can't do is create a rule as a junior in high school that says, do you want the white shirt or the white shirt? It's, it's not interesting enough. They're abstract thinkers. It's like saying to a junior in high school, don't have sex, you'll get pregnant. That's so not interesting enough, because they know a million people who've had sex and are not pregnant. Now, if you want to tell a sixth grader that, that's good for them. They like that. It's practical. It's black and white. They can judge it. But for a junior in high school, it has to feel more interesting. Does that make sense? So, so I'm going to share, uh, well, maybe somebody wants to ask a question before I'm going to finish up. I say to kids, sex is a wonderful way that people have to communicate really interesting things to each other. There, with every action, there are consequences. You could get pregnant. You could get a sexually transmitted. One quarter of the kids in this school have a sexually transmitted disease. Um, so I really want you to use your, not just your body parts, but your brain as well, to make a decision about that, because you put things at risk. There is more than the consequence of coming together. So part of it is building information, but trying not to build it entirely on fear, because fear is a, the worst educator of the world. Some fear is good, 
Some fear is always good. Kids tend to say no based on fear, faith, and family. But you don't, it, there isn't any great education built entirely on fear. Especially when it comes to sex. Because there's a lot about sex that isn't bad. In fact, it's pretty great. And it would be really interesting if our kids understood how great it was, and then they would, might honor it and respect it. But somehow, at least in this culture, we spent a whole lot of time talking about the, the anxiety, bad, celebrity-obsessed sex, and that has trivialized sex. And then that has created some really challenging responses to sex and sexuality and, and all that. And I, I kind of wish we talked more about how great it is and how wonderful it can be. And then we get a chance to show, I, I, here's my talk that I give to high school kids. I go, hey, I've got an hour to talk about sex. <laughs> it would be in, it's really impossible to talk about sex in an hour. It'd be like trying to tell you about the ocean in an hour. I mean, I could bring pictures of the ocean, we could bring a video of the ocean, I could bring you sand and ocean water, we could listen to the ocean sounds, tell stories about the ocean, but in an hour, you still wouldn't know what it feels like to stand on the beach and look at the sunset at the ocean. You wouldn't know what it feels like to be in a submarine 20,000 leagues below in the ocean or on a sailboat out in the Caribbean in the ocean. I mean, there's still so much you don't know about the ocean. But as we talk about sex like an ocean, I want you to know that the world will try to tell you that sex, if I filled this with ocean water, they would tell you this is sex. And when people think about hookups and having sexual experiences, it's not about a lifetime of a sexual intimacy or sexual connection or sexual relationship with someone. A hookup is simply ocean water in a bottle like this. When I was talking to a group of high school girls down in California, up comes an, an anonymous card. And it said, what if I have had um, 50 hookups. Do I know more about sex? I said, well, you have a collection of water bottles, but you really don't know anything about the ocean. Pornography, pornography is like we took ocean, we took water, we added salt, we filled this and then we sold it to you. It has elements of the ocean, real elements of the ocean, but it's not entirely the ocean. It's just parts of the ocean that we then can sell you so that you can experience part of the ocean, but it's not really the ocean at all. It's just a water bottle of water and salt. These extraordinary girls, they want to know really big, important ideas. They want to know questions that are driving them nuts, like, is sex like in the movies? Um, do you, here's, my, here's my question from these girls, the same group of girls. What if you think you have an STD? What if you're bad at sex? What if you're super inexperienced, like you haven't even had your first kiss? What is the appropriate age to lose your virginity? Where can I get a prescription for birth control? What are the advantages, disadvantages of having sex before marriage? Can you just fool around with your underwear on? How awkward is it? Can it be magical like the movies? These are seniors in high school. They're, they're interested, they're curious. They want to know about the ocean. I kind of wish we could have talked about the ocean their whole lives. Then when they got to be a senior in high school, they'd have this sort of, this idea about sex being big, not, not little like it would be easy to figure out, right? It's so fun to picture. What is it that we need to tell our kids about sex and their bodies and their 
their, themselves and respecting and their emotional selves and what is a healthy relationship. I, I, there isn't any better work in the world. So where would you start? How would you start that conversation? Well, I am going to tell you that you could start right now today, right today and tomorrow, by loving well the people in your life. Go heal it with your brother. Go take care of your neighbor. Show commitment and intimacy to people that are important to you. Because that sex is built on those building blocks. And sometimes we get caught up with telling kids what sex isn't. And we get frightened for them. And in fact, I kind of wish we spent more time telling them what it is and what it could be and what we hope for them. And I think sometimes we spend too much time talking about body parts and and instead of talking about what it means and showing them what it means to respect each other and love each other well. I don't know that you actually have to say the words penis and vagina at your dining room table like I do. I, I think that you really just have to show that commitment, intimacy, physical, caring, desire, are interesting human being responses to other human beings. And that their curiosity, their interest is respected. And that we honor it so much that what we hope for them is the very most amazing physical aspect of their lives, that it would be healthy and amazing, wouldn't we? I, I think it would be fun to challenge ourselves to try to talk to our kids about what we wish for them, what we hope for them. So I'm going to finish with one idea. And that is this, when I, um, you know, so I've taught about puberty and sex for, for 28 years, and at the beginning of those 28 years, we used to have a smaller group, and I would ask the girls to introduce themselves and the person that they came with and something that they enjoy doing together, and we'd whip through the auditorium. And one night, I'm having them introduce themselves, and we get down to the very last mother-daughter in the front row, and this girl says, I, my name is Caroline, this is my mother, Judy, and we like talking every day about the canopy and the forest floor. I go, wow, uh, Caroline, I don't even know what that means. Like, you talk about the canopy and the forest floor every day is what you enjoy doing together. What does that mean, actually? She goes, ah, the rainforest. I go, so wait a sec. I mean, most people have said other things here, like, what do you mean you just talk about the rainforest every day? She goes, no, no, not exactly the rainforest, the canopy and the forest floor. I go, okay, what does that mean? And she goes, we're talking about the highs and lows of every day. My God, it's really beautiful. You've created a tradition, a ritual, and you've named it, and you have your secret name for it, and it's canopy and forest floor, and you're talking about the highs and lows of every day, and you know that you'll center back to this place of shared ritual every day. I love that. So then I went home, I Googled rainforest and canopy and forest floor, and I just started thinking about the whole parenting, grandparenting, family thing. I was thinking it's a lot like the rainforest. The rainforest is super fragile, it's very vulnerable, it's so diverse and interesting and precious. It's the most exquisite pieces of property on this planet. Just like how I feel about a family. Exquisite, precious, vulnerable things. And the canopy is where everybody likes to hang out in the rainforest. Like 85% of the life of a rainforest is in the canopy. We'd all love to be in the canopy. It's the high. And nobody really wants to hang out on the forest floor. It's dark down there. There's a lot of bugs and stuff. It's dark. Yet, I guarantee, I guarantee that by the end of the month, Many of you will have spent time on the forest floor with your teen or preteen. Uh, it's just, it's so easy to do. It's a quick D. It's getting kicked out of whatever. It's smoking a cigarette. It's totaling your car. It's making a big mistake. It's calling you an idiot, whatever it is. And now all of a sudden you're down on the forest floor. I'm going to remind you that the rainforest cannot exist 
without the forest floor. In fact, some of the most important branches of your brain happen from time on the forest floor. And I'm thinking, though, that it's also helpful to remember that sometimes in our culture, we look and feel very ashamed on the forest floor. We don't talk about it much. We don't share people about our difficulty on the forest floor. And in fact, we sometimes even forget to look back up in the canopy. And those of us in the canopy, we feel so sweet that we're up there. We feel like we've pretty much got this whole parenting life family thing down that we forget sometimes that the forest floor even exists. We think, well, we kind of deserve to be up here, really. But actually in a community, assuming that everybody here will definitely be on the forest floor, I'm going to invite you to remember when you're up in the canopy to look down occasionally and when you see her, you say, here's a vine. I've been down there before and it's not fun. And I will help you. I'll bring you lasagna. I'll call your house, I'll check in on you. It could take you a year, a month, a week, two years, I don't really know, but I'm here with this vine, you and me. And then when I'm down there, occasionally I'm gonna be looking at people like you and I'm gonna be going, hey, hello, weren't you just down here a little bit ago? I could really use a vine. <laughs> and I'm hoping you'll show up with some lasagna while I'm down here because it's very lonely down here on the forest floor. Our kids are interesting people. Their brains are wired up to seek approval and, and, and pleasure and just those two ideas alone is a guaranteed mistake make, on its way. How can it not be? Yet our opportunity to stay connected to let them know they are heard and understood could be the most powerful thing we do to help them become better people, right? So with that, go out there, do the work that you need to do. And this has been very lovely for me. Thank you so much.